braised in olive oil and oregano. It's Late Night with David Letterman. Tonight, Peter O'Toole, comedian Rich Hall, and sportscaster Sparky Mortimer, plus Paul Schaefer and the world's most dangerous man. And now, that big, lovable, purple dinosaur, David! <laughs> Welcome to the uh, program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, news from NASA. Are you, are you beginning to wonder about this now? Here's the deal. Last week, I guess it was like Tuesday or Wednesday, NASA was going to launch another uh, space shuttle mission. And at the very last second, because there was a problem with a valve, the delicate sensory equipment in the computers that power the engines on the rockets sensed a problem. They shut it down, everything was fine. But it came within like a second of actually taking off. Well, almost identically the same thing happened earlier this morning. A last second problem. The computers, the sensors sensed the trouble and they shut down the rocket engines with, with like a second to go in the countdown. And NASA says because of these delays now on, on the next shuttle launch, the astronauts will all get uh, free headphone rental. But, uh, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know about uh, Amy Fisher, if you were uh, dialed up from around the United States. <laughs> Now, say what you will about Amy Fisher, and of course, many have. Uh, she's doing something I think is rather important. She's doing a series now of public service announcements here in the New York City area, urging kids, urging kids to please stay in jail. Oh. Oh. <laughs> please, please, kids. <laughs> urging the kids to please, please. if you can. Stay in jail. <laughs> Uh, I guess you know that uh, last week, was it last week they, they filmed the final episode of the uh, blockbuster Cheers? Do you folks watch Cheers on NBC on Thursday night? <laughs> and uh, it's been on the air for 10 years and like a hugely successful show. This is one of those programs, uh, if a child is born tomorrow, and, and likely there will be one, <laughs> That child will be able to see, assuming that the first thing they do when the child is born is they uh, put him up in front of a TV and let him watch. <laughs> He'll be able to watch Cheers now every half hour for the rest of his life nonstop. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those shows. Did, did I explain that properly? I think because so. Because, well, anyway. So they were, they were talking to the cast and crew after the uh, filming of the final episode of Cheers, and uh, they were reflecting on their 10 years together, and they said, you know, we're, we're sad to be going our separate ways, but in all honesty, uh, the show, doing the show, hasn't been as much fun. Oh, I guess it was uh, when General Electric started watering the drinks. That's... <laughs> what did I tell you? Yes! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, opening day was yesterday. Yeah, oh, good news for the... Sure, go ahead, knock yourselves out. <laughs> The uh, New York Yankees defeated the Cleveland Indians 9-1 yesterday. 
Uh, Don Mattingly uh, was two for five. Uh, Danny Tartable was three for five. And uh, Steve Howe, by the way, was five for five. But that was, that was drug testing. So. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no, oh, we have a delightful program. Peter O'Toole is here tonight, a fine, fine actor. Peter O'Toole. A, uh, a very funny comedian and an old friend of ours, uh, Rich Hall, is here on the show this evening. What did I tell you? <laughs> That's my new catchphrase slogan. What is that? What do you think of it? What, what did I tell you? Ah. Yeah. Uh, also uh, joining us on the program from uh, the uh, beautiful, beautiful state of Utah, we have a, uh, a young man who is a uh, sports expert, a broadcaster and a sports expert. This man has a mind like a magnet, like a sponge and a magnet. If you could, <laughs> if you could magnetize a sponge, that's what this man's mind is like. He knows just about everything there is to understand and know about the world of sports. His name is Sparky Mortimer. Well, what did I tell you? <laughs> now, here's your friend Paul Schaefer, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, David. I gotta tell you something quickly. Happy Passover, by the way. Last Happy night Passover I went to, to you. Thank you. I went to the most interesting Passover Seder again this year. Stevie Wonder was there. It was the most exciting thing. They gave him a piece of matzah. He said, who wrote this? <laughs> but happy Passover to you. Well, thank you, Paul, <laughs> for invoking that bit of ugliness early. Ah, uh, President uh, Clinton out there in the Pacific Northwest had the big uh, summit meeting with Boris Yeltsin, and I'm sitting at home Sunday, you know, I think it's a good idea that President Clinton runs. I think I'm all in favor of that. Do you, have, do you folks like the idea that our president gets up and jogs every day? I have no problem with that uh, whatsoever. And, and generally, I can't think of anything to, 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 to criti critique or criticize the current administration for or about. And so I'm sitting at home Sunday and I'm watching uh, one of the... Thank you very much. I'm watching uh, one of the uh, news magazine uh, programs, and they run this footage of Bill Clinton running with his entourage and his uh, FBI guys, Secret Service guys. Roll that, will you, Hal? There you go. There. Now, look. I have no problem with this. But is he sending the right message by wearing tights? <laughs> Men in tights, uh... Why is he wearing those that. tights? I don't know. It looks like the bottom half, it looks like the bottom half of a really bad mascot costume, you know? <laughs> like, he hasn't, he, hasn't, he hasn't put the owl head uh, on like or some something kind of yet. San Diego he's, chicken Yeah, he's got the bottom half of the, <laughs> the costume on. Bill Clinton, our president, running there. What are we doing on the uh, program? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for another Hal Gurney Network Time Keller. What do you have for us tonight, oh, Hal? Yeah, yeah, I love that. in uh, lieu of actual entertainment, you know. There's the uh, control room here in uh, 6A. Hi, There's Dave. Ha Hi, Hal. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Nice to see you, Hal. You too, Dave. Hal, why don't you introduce the folks in there with you? Oh, you know Jerry Foley. Hi, I Jerry. How are you? Nice to see you. Ruth Roberts over Ruth, there. Ruth, nice to see you. Pete Fadovich, uh, R.A.D. Pete, Dave. good to have yeah. you with us. Remember Jude. Yeah, yeah Jude Brennan. There's... Pete, wait a minute. Pete, I was heard you talking about there was some trouble at the house last night when you got home. Yeah. Yeah, what happened? Oh, some dinner. What'd you have? Cold shoulder and hot tongue. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> All right, Hal, so now let's get back to uh, what you were talking about. Uh, uh, Dave, uh, you asked me what we had tonight? Yeah, on the big network time killer okay uh tonight we have a very special treat from the world-renowned Cirque du Soleil remember they were on once before oh, yeah they're the very best Cirque oh, du Soleil they're, they're in town now aren't they, they, they Hal? are in town they're going to be here uh, actually performing at Battery Park through May 2nd and let's introduce now the Chelnikov family all, all right thank you Hal
How about that? I was, I was talking to those people earlier, and they told me that they got the idea for the act one rainy day at home, and then they were making their own pretzels. <laughs> that gave them the idea for the act. Uh, Funny how things come from the strangest place. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do a commercial, and uh, when we come back, uh, Peter O'Toole will join us. Nice to see you tonight. Thanks for being here. program this evening, the famous uh, film star and uh, all-around uh, raconteur and uh, screen idol Peter O'Toole is here, Rich Hall, and Sparky Mortimer. Hey, what did I tell you? Uh -huh. uh, the top ten list tonight from the home office in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. This is a list uh, that is prepared for us in the, uh, the home office. It's ten items, and it's uh, on a specific su subject every evening. Uh -huh. And we've been doing this now for years and years and years. It's a little icebreaker, it's a little brain teaser, it's a little party puzzler. It's just a little something to kick your day off when you're chatting with your family tomorrow around the breakfast table about tonight's program. It's the top, we, and we call it the top ten list. Ah. Yeah, the category, top ten things overheard at the summit. This is the, uh, the big summit out there in the Pacific Northwest. Top ten things now overheard at that mm. summit meeting. Here we go, number ten. Look, forget the money, we want that miracle spray on hair stuff, number nine. <laughs> Imagine what you'd look like if you didn't jog every day. Number eight, for a strong president, you really have soft skin. Uh, number seven, get some vodka into that Al Gore of yours. Number six, uh, what? We have no timeouts left. Number five, uh, Margaret Thatcher. Margaret, that's a reference to the basketball game last night. I knew that. I knew Man, that was a, what a tough way to lose that contest. Well, Michigan, North Carolina? Yeah. Man, alive. Well... Um, uh, number five, Margaret Thatcher, I had her. Number four, oh. hey, Bubba, leave some gravy for the Ruski. Number three, the Red Army has been gay for years and it's a blast. Number two, number two, and get ready to go nuts. When do I get to meet this Joey Buttafuoco? <laughs> there. What did I tell you? <laughs> Top-notch comedy. What did I tell you? It's catching on. Uh, and uh, the number one uh, thing overheard at the summit, last call already. Our first guest is truly a star of stage and truly the screen. Uh, his classic, uh, classic motion pictures include uh, Lawrence of Arabia and Beckett and The Lion in Winter. He has uh, now written uh, this autobiography entitled Loitering with Intent. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Peter O'Toole. <laughs> Good to have you with us on the program again. Now, David, I know that you work to certain <laughs> patterns in your head, but there's something I must do. Uh -huh. A terrible thing has been done in New York today, in Central Park, this morning. A man dressed in white, holding a bat, impersonating a cricketer. Uh -huh. <laughs> on television, I have an eyewitness, and claiming he was demonstrating how to play the game. And he said, no, 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 it won't take a moment. No. <laughs> he said, what you do is you defend your stumps against the ball, and you can stay there for five days. It's not so, and I must, this is, this is to delude, this is to delude the American public. It's wrong. The first thing a cricketer wants to do is to knock the ball out of the park, mm -hmm. while at the same time, not being out in one of the nine ways in which, at cricket, 
You can be out. No, I didn't drop a participle. <laughs> All right, now, you, you brought this up. Now, I, I know just enough about cricket to not know anything at all about it. <laughs> I've, I've seen it played, and it's fascinating, and it's obviously uh, connected somehow in the distant past to American baseball. What, what are the differences? What are the nine ways a batsman can be put out? Oh, no, it's too long and far too complicated. Um, but oh, I'm thanks. very pleased. Thanks that, a lot. I'm pleased. <laughs> I'm pleased that the Mets won yeah. three nothing. All right. And Godber is a beautiful pitcher. I'm sorry. Who was that? Godber. Godber. The pitcher. Beautiful. <laughs> and the Yankees won nine. Yankees won yesterday nine one as well. Right. Right. Well done. You you coach a, a cricket team? I do. Yeah. What age group of uh, folks? Under 12. Oh, wow. That's, that must be very exciting for you. I love it. What, what kind of a schedule is that for 12-year-olds? Um, they come and they learn how to hold a bat, how to throw the ball. But I will not go into cricket. It's very, very boring. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry I brought it up then. Uh, let's talk about the book. Was this, uh, uh, this is, the book is three parts. It's your life story in three parts. What was the best part about writing this book for you? Was it being able to, to actually go back physically and relive parts of your early life? Was that, yes, that must it have was been a... lovely. I, at one point, I was taken by a documentary firm to, to a race course where my father was a bookie. And we went to a track which I knew when I was a child. And as we got into the track, we parked the car in the car park. I thought, this is wrong. This is terribly wrong. We should have parked a hundred yards away outside the track mm -hmm. in case we had to make an early departure. <laughs> That's the way it had been with you and, and your dad. That's right. And why, why the need for an early departure? We might have owed someone money. I see. Which we didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, are, now are there still people at this track who remember you in those days, from those days, remember your father? I walked onto the track thinking, you know, and a man said, your father gave me my first job at a point-to-point -point meeting in 1938. And for a whole day, I was not Peter O'Toole. I was Pat's son. Mm -hmm. It was enchanting. Yeah. And they, they were nice to you, obviously forgetting about the old debts, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think they would have demanded them had they wanted them. Yeah. Um, t t talk a little bit about uh, your relationship with, P uh, with uh, Richard Burton. We were doing a film called Beckett. I, I, Richard and I were very friendly. He was friendly to me since I was a young man. And we eventually got together and we were doing a film called Beckett, which was with lots of heroes of ours, John Gielgud, Donald Wolfitt, many other people. Um, and we said to each other, we swore that throughout the picture we'd be on our best behavior. We wouldn't take any alcohol at all. How old were the two of you then? What was, what was your age? In me, 29, 30, Richard, about 35. Kids, indestructible. Indestruct, right. <laughs> and this we did. We, we, were, we were virtuous, pure. You know the feeling. <laughs> well, now, come on. We were. <laughs> and uh, we'd finished a long scene in a cathedral, and we said good night, and it was a Friday. And we'd done this enormous long scene, and we'd been working for about eight weeks. And I thought, well, might as well, it's all over. Have a little drop. Sure. And I went one way and Richard went another. Well, they found that a scene which involved me putting on a ring on Richard's hand and making him an archbishop or something uh, was ruined in the lab. And they wanted us back on Saturday morning. <laughs> I was found under a piano. <laughs> in a club at about three-ish. And my driver wisely took me to the studio where I had a little snore in the car park. Uh -huh. Richard was found under a table <laughs> in a place called a pair of shoes. <laughs> and his driver didn't have the wisdom to take him to the studio. He took him to the hotel uh -huh. <laughs> where he had a snore. I, I was nearly sober by the time <laughs> he, he arrived. Uh, 
when I drank, I used to get longer and thinner. <laughs> Richard got amazingly more, more squat. Yeah. And if, he couldn't turn his head like that. He'd have to turn his entire body. <laughs> <laughs> so I was sitting thinking, well, this isn't too bad. I can nearly see and have a, <laughs> a cup of coffee. And I looked down the corridor, and coming down the corridor was the oldest Welshman I'd ever seen in my life. It was Richard. Yeah. It was a huge face. And they put lots of makeup. And by about half an hour of, of solid makeup, he looked about 70, yeah. and I looked about 60. <laughs> and then we decided we'd try, try and do the scene. Yeah. Well, he held his finger up, and it was waving around like a bee's <laughs> wing. And I had the ring. And I... <laughs> if you put it very, finger... very difficult thing. But... You, you shake. Yeah. And I... <laughs> but, but... <laughs> we just, <laughs> we couldn't make it. Yeah. <laughs> Is it noticeable in the film, if you go to see the film? Can you determine, do you detect that, or is it imperceptible? We decided the best thing to do was for me to hold the ring like that, and he would make a charm. <laughs> <laughs> it's perceptible. Oh, man. Uh, let's see. We need to do a commercial, Peter. Hang around if you can, and uh, we'll continue chatting with Mr. O'Toole right after that. After you watch Cops at 7, it would be a real crime to miss Love Connection at 7.30. You don't have on any underwear. Because the action is just as intense. Blood, guts, everywhere. But in a different way entirely. I like my breasts on fire. There's no escaping these romances. So you went over to this guy and you grabbed him? And nobody wants to. Take me, baby, I'm yours. Cops at 7, Love Connection at 7.30. Weeknights on 4 New York. Now this is an arresting lineup. Let it all hang out. here. Rich Hall uh, will be out later. And uh, speaking of sports, as we were, a guy named Sparky Mortimer. Hang around for that. It's fascinating. I think you'll get a kick out of it. The magic sponge. Yeah, that's right. The, <laughs> the magnetic sponge. Exactly. Uh, let's uh, talk about other people that you've worked with. Uh, Richard Harris, of course. Richard Burton, Richard Harris. Two, two actors, two fellow countrymen, more or less, who also uh, drink. <laughs> drank. Drank. <laughs> Frank. Yeah. <clears throat> when we had drunk, uh -huh. <laughs> Richard and I were a bit Harris. Oh, we were young. Uh, 54. <laughs> no. Was it really? 54? In 1954, yeah. Oh, 1954. No. Oh. <laughs> 1954. Very young and poor and drunk. And Richard said, uh, Let's get a woman. I'm sorry, let's get a... Woman. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> you heard of let's, let's try that now. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> where? He said, I know where there's a rack of them. <laughs> oh, my God. So he took me to a place in Earl's Court in London, which has high buildings, five stories high. And they lived on the top floor. Be in. Rang the bell. Of course, no answer. Mm -hmm. Very sensible girls. <laughs> he said, Gee! <laughs> he was furious. <laughs> ah! So I said, Well, don't be dismayed, sweetheart. It's easy. We'll just pop up the drain pipe. Climb up the outside of the building. Climb up the, yeah. the drain pipe. Up the down pipe. Yeah. yeah. So I went up, five stories. It's a long way up. <laughs> and tapped on the window, and the little girl's face popped down. She said, come in. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So in I went. He never climbed a drain pipe in his life. <laughs> so he began to climb, and he got, <laughs> he was furious that I was up there, and he hadn't quite got the knack. There's a knack to it, like cricket or baseball. <laughs> There's a knack to it. And he, <laughs> 
just between the fourth floor and the fifth floor, and the pipe broke. Mm. <laughs> which left him standing on one bit of the pipe uh -huh. and hanging on with his fingernails <laughs> to the window ledge of the fifth floor. And uh, he could neither go up nor down. <laughs> <laughs> so we telephoned for the fire brigade. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and with the fire brigade came the police. Right. And I shouted down, this is an Irish hooligan <laughs> who's trying to break into our home. <laughs> <laughs> and he was arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to break into our home. Man, that, that's great. You, you can't have fun like that anymore, can you? <laughs> or, or can you? Maybe you're still having fun have like that. Have you seen Richard recently? He was here, uh, but not recently. I guess at least a, a year, a couple he, of years. He's wilder now that he's sober. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lucky to be alive, though, I would think. <laughs> Uh, now, the, the, this is the first of three. Yes. The three parts of your life, Loitering with Intent uh, by Peter O'Toole. Peter, it's always great fun to have you with us. Good luck with the book and good luck with anything else that is going on in your life. And good luck with you, Mr. Lester. Thank you, sir. Peter O'Toole. Frostbite Falls is paying to watch grass grow. Gee, Rock, isn't this fun? No, it's boring, and I know who's behind it. Get your McBoris burgers. Burger is so boring, grass growing is exciting. <laughs> Luckily, Rocky had delicious Taco Bell tacos. Original, supreme, and the new big beef. Here, Bullwinkle, try this. The colossal crunch awoke the town from their boredom, and they tarred and feathered the two culprits. <laughs> hey, this is Astro Turn. How do you do? Uh, George Foreman is on the show tomorrow. George Foreman is uh, a former uh, uh, heavyweight champion former of the world. Heavyweight yep. champion. And I think he's going to have one more fight and then he'll retire. Is that right? George Foreman will be here tomorrow. He's great. George Foreman has uh, 11 kids, eight boys, all of whom are named George. George. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, uh, Paul uh, Rogers from Bad Company. Yeah, that's right. And Brian Setzer from Stray Cats. Exactly. Will correct. be here. Yeah. Around the world, around the block, Everywhere you go, the kids want to rock. Uh, what did I tell you? And uh, Catherine O'Hara, what's the signal you're trying to give to me? Okay, good. Uh, Rich Hall will be out here in a couple of minutes, and uh, Sparky... Sparky Mortimer, you, you, you folks are going to be glad you took a nap this afternoon when you, when you see Sparky Mortimer. We'll, we'll do another commercial. We'll be right back. Our next guest is a uh, talented writer and comedian. He will be performing in San Juan, Puerto Rico on May 5th. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Rich Hall. Rich! Hi. Well, I, uh, I just heard that uh, John Mellencamp and uh, Willie Nelson are doing a benefit this summer for uh, General Motors. So that should just take care of all their problems right there. What are they gonna call this one? Lemonade? <laughs> That's the answer to all our economic problems right there. Get John Mellencamp. Company going under, get John Mellencamp. Can't make the payroll, get John Mellencamp. <laughs> See, I kind of feel like this sorry for General Motors because, you know, the whole company is getting blamed for things that you know are just like one guy's fault. Like, I'm sure it was just one guy who mounted those tanks, you know, on the outside of the frame. You know, he just, he thought it would look cherry. And it's like, and the, and the Hubble telescope, you know, General Motors builds the Hubble telescope and then the mirrors don't quite work. Well, they don't work at all, actually. You know, as one guy, he just was goofing around the assembly line, 
Probably put a Buick mirror by accident on there. It's just floating around. Somewhere there's a Buick riding around with a Hubble mirror mounted on it. Kind of a crummy car with a great mirror. Some guy sitting in traffic. Honey, I can see Venus in this mirror. I got a planet on my butt. Back off! That's why I don't trust a... I don't quite trust Clinton because uh, I don't think he can fix all our uh, economic problems. It's not even his responsibility. Also, the guy wanted to be president. He must be nuts. Who would want to be president? <coughs> We're like, what, $4 trillion in debt? Would you want to be the manager of a store that was $4 trillion in debt? What are you going to do? Uh, we'll have a sale. I don't know. <laughs> Unloads the stuff around here. I think we should have just a, like a White House lawn sale, you know, just sell off. Stuff we don't need. Crummy stuff, you know, Sears, IBM, Hubble Telescope, Dallas Mavericks, some cheese. I don't know. It's a set. We can't break it up. Come on. Maybe we should unload some states. North and South Dakota. Who the hell ever goes there? <laughs> Who would miss it if we sold them? Sell them to the Germans. We'll have to drive to get there. We'll, we'll gouge them. We'll gouge them along the way. We'll get them. Where I live, which is near the Dakotas, and I know baseball season opened up, and I'm very excited about that. But unfortunately, we have the Pioneer League. You familiar with this? The players are not as good as Major League players, obviously. Neither are the announcers. The Billings announcer, Billings, Montana announcer, the guy has no depth perception whatsoever. Like, he can't tell the difference between 20 feet and 200 feet. Like, I'm driving along listening to the radio, and he's announcing the game, and it's something like, Reynolds is up at the plate, he swings, there's a shallow pop-up, second baseman settles under it. It's out of here. <laughs> People are driving off the road there, you know? Uh, now, this is true. I don't know if you know this or if you're from Memphis, Tennessee, but, you know, Memphis is trying to get an NFL team, an expansion team. You know, if they can raise the money, they can get John Mellencamp or whatever, you know? <laughs> and I think that'd be pretty cool if Memphis gets a football team because they're going to have to call them the Elvises. There's <laughs> 11 Elvises walking out on the field, big white jumpsuit uniform, belt buckle. Big pork chop sideburns painted on his arms there. Quarterback would go back for every pass like this. <laughs> I'm only the nine millionth person to do an Elvis impression there, so. Um, I saw Mike Tyson on the news the other day. I think they should let him out of jail. He's done enough time, hasn't he? Come on. Okay, so he groped and fondled a little bit, but he didn't do anything any senator in this country hasn't done. <laughs> How much difference is there between Mike Tyson and, say, the Kennedys? You know? Kennedys? Tyson. Tyson's job is to uh, make other boxers stagger to their knees, whereas the uh, Kennedys prefer to stagger around with their boxers at their knees. <laughs> Good to have you with us. Thanks, Dave. Very funny. Nice Thank you job. Very much. Now you you uh, you mentioned that you live near the Dakotas. Uh, You're referring I, yeah, to Montana. Montana. Which you accused me of lying about the last time. <laughs> I, I don't think I accused you of you lying. You asked me what the elevation was, and I couldn't come up with it. And, uh, <laughs> well, you called so me a liar. Well, well what is the elevation of the area you're in? <laughs> it's, it's the same as here. It's no, same it's as, not. No, the no. same as up here on, on this floor. No, yeah, it's, oh, uh, this is the same as the sixth floor. Yeah, it's like a mile up. It's a mile. <laughs> hey, what, is life, what is life like for you in Montana? Uh, the reason, and I've never said this before, I was a scofflaw in Los Angeles. I got so many speeding tickets uh -huh. that I and you ignored refused them. to pay them. Yeah, yeah, and they came looking for me, and I moved to Montana. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Where there are no laws. Right. No there's reciprocity. A five, yeah, there's a $5 speeding. If you get a speeding ticket in Montana, it's five bucks. It's like... It's like an all-you-can-speed salad bar. You know, it's just, it's along. There's five bucks. Woo! You know, driving along. Uh, when I was in Los Angeles, I actually did. I got a, a license plate that said void on it for a while. Uh -huh. Because, uh, you know, I get speeding tickets and write void on the <laughs> That worked for a year. Yeah. And, and they nailed me. Are you, uh, uh, are you living out there alone? I know you have a, a ranch kind of deal out there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah do you, do I do you, live alone, yeah. yeah. Do you like life up there? Uh, it's the I big sky country, isn't it? It is the big sky, but yeah. that's not true. The sky is not bigger 
How can the sky be bigger? It's you know, the, people... the, the endless horizon creates the impression of endless sky. Right, but it's not really bigger. Well, I think we because all understand. Because you'd be looking down at this. If it was any bigger than the sky here, you'd be looking down at the sky. You know what I'm saying? Let me see. I think we like, all nobody's know. Nobody's really that. measured the oh, sky. It's a figure of speech, that's right. all. Yeah, right. uh, yes, I, I do live alone. Yeah. Is that, do you like that? Well, it's kind of pathetic, yeah, I know, but uh, <laughs> I'm not desperate or uh, anything, you know. Uh, I, well, you, you know, I mean, I feel a little, uh, you know, nervous saying this, but, uh, you know, I mean, I fall in love. Well, good. Occasionally. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> this is my advice, though, okay? It's love and in love, of course, I, are not the same no. thing. Yeah. You know, many people think they love. They're just in love. And before, so if you're thinking about falling in love, here's Rich's advice, okay? Take it from me. Before you, you think you're in love, go out and, and get one of those uh, paint ladders, you know, five steps. And on the bottom, get a big black magic mark and write, alone, A-L-O-N-E, alone. And then you write interaction. And then you write uh, uh, attraction on the next step. And then, you know, up here on this part where you put the paint cans, it says, this is not a step. Yeah. You write, in love. Yeah. And then on the very top, you write, love. And then you just start climbing that little ladder of love, Dave. <laughs> so you get right up to that part where the paint is. And you stand on that, and then you just watch your sorry butt go tumbling right back down. <laughs> watch your chin just dribbling across the right back. And then you'll know that being in love is not a step. And that's well, it's a Uncle valuable Rich's advice. lesson yeah, to, right. to right. have right. learned for all of us. Okay. <laughs> this is Mr. Lonely Hearts advice. I never talk about my personal life. It was very painful to talk Well, to I talk appreciate about. you bearing your soul, so to speak, for us tonight. Uh, we have to go, Rich. Good to see you. Let's see, did we mention where you're going to be? Uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico, May, yeah. May 5th. Uh, what kind of place is that? What kind of job is that? A hotel? A casino? I'm sure people will be yelling, Il Snegaletto. Il <laughs> <laughs> Snegaletto. But, uh, no, I'm trying to become an international star, so this oh, is my well, big good. step. Yeah. <laughs> good for you. Nice to see you again, Rich. Good job. Good call, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back. Look, right In his uh, first season covering football and basketball for KUTV in Salt Lake City, our next guest has distinguished himself among his peers with his encyclopedic knowledge of the world of sports. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the program the one, the only, Sparky Mortimer. Sparky! <laughs> You're, you're dressing like every sportscaster I've ever known in my life. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Sparky. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. You know, what I, I liked about your entrance, you came out and you had a nice, friendly wave for everyone. That's a good touch. Did, did your folks teach you that? Or does that come naturally to you? It comes natu naturally yeah. to me. Yeah, well, it, it works very well for you. Sparky, is, is Sparky your name or is that a nickname? Well... It's actually a nickname because my real name is David. Uh-huh. Hey, you know, that's my name. I'm Dave. I'm David. Dave. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, my real name is David, but they call me Sparky because when I was young, I was kind of hyper. <laughs> kind of hyper? Yeah. <laughs> and your folks gave you the name Sparky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how old are you now? Did we, did we establish that? How old are you, Sparky? Seven. Seven years old. And that means you're in, uh, what, a sophomore in high school? <laughs> you're like first, second grade, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in first. Yeah. Sparky, how, how did you get the job as a sportscaster at KUTV in Salt Lake City there? Well, at the BYU football game against Fresno State, the homecoming game, <laughs> Yes, the homecoming game. Uh-huh. Well, I was doing my sports casting, and Michelle King of QTV, who's a, who's a former homecoming queen of BYU, by the way. Uh -huh. <laughs> sat, sat in front of me, and she heard me, and she turned around and said, Wow, this is neat. 
stage. I want to show this. So, on the pregame show of the BYU-Utah game, they showed it. Uh huh. So this was you in the stands at the game doing some play-by-play. -play. Yes, yeah. that was the game on Halloween against Penn State. Was that? Oh, I see. That, so that wasn't the homecoming game. That was a subsequent game. Yeah, that was a non-conference game. Non-conference game, yeah. <laughs> Did you, uh, did you have a date for homecoming? Well, I'm a season ticket holder. <laughs> <laughs> I get the tickets from my grandpa. Yeah. yeah. And then you have to get your own date or grandpa gets you the dates? <laughs> How does it... Uh, Sparky, we have some videotape, I think. I think that's what you're talking about. This is you in the stands doing the call of a, is it, this is a basketball game we're going to look at, right? Yes, you're about to see the game. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're about to see. You're about to see the game when the Utah Jazz beat the New York Knicks 104-87. Now, the reason the Jazz won is because They yeah, had the big Phoenix, uh, New York fight. Well, Doc Rivers and Kevin Johnson, who once restarted it, they were fighting. And as a result, they were not able to play. Greg Anthony and Doc Rivers. Greg Anthony was injured. He wasn't too well to play, but he was he was very full of energy to fight. Mm -hmm. He was he was a little how shall we say it a little sparkier than. <laughs> So, so here now we have uh, your call of the Utah Jazz New York Knicks, right? Yeah. All right, roll it, Hal. Here we go. Sparky Mortimer in the stands. NBA basketball here at the Dome Center. Jazz and Knicks. I'm saying he's back to his Duncan. Two three. And it's gone. Taken by Smith over to Davis. Over the start. Start. Somebody Ewing. And Ewing with his first bucket of the game off the rim. There you go. We have, to do a, we have to do a commercial, okay? And then uh, we'll be right back here, folks. <laughs> okay, okay, Sparky, what do you want to do when you grow up? I think I might be a sportscaster. <laughs> you kind of get that feeling, do you? Yeah. Good for you. Nice to meet you. Enjoy yourself in New York City. Thanks for coming. <laughs> we have to go, folks. We'll see you tomorrow night. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye.